everyone's having trouble with Korean, it's hard to find interesting input. Exactly. That's very interesting. Um, my conjecture, last few years, is that the best input shouldn't just be interesting. It should be very interesting. So interesting that nothing else matters. So interesting that you're in a state of flow. A term we got from Chinsek Mahali. When you're in flow, the world disappears around you. Only the conversation you're in matters. Only the movie matters. Watching Terminator 14 on the airplane. Yes, okay. Can't wait till the novelization comes out. Uh, Chinsek Mahali and his colleagues have done a lot of research on flow. They have found it as universal. Mountain climbers in northern Italy say when they're climbing the mountain, their sense of time disappears, their sense of self disappears. Only the mountain matters. My favorite study was motorcycle racers, motorcycle riders who like to ride their motorcycles really loud in downtown Tokyo, young men. They, their hypothesis was that they did it to impress the girls. And that turned out to be true. But they also found out that when they were doing it, only the motorcycle exists. Everything else disappears. Well, this is what happens, this is what we're aiming for when it happens in another language. I want to show you how I got onto this and give you some case histories. Uh, the two case histories in language come from Christy Lau, who's a former student of mine, lives in the San Francisco area. Uh, her, the first one's about her son. I heard his name here is Paul, but his real name is Vincent, I can tell you that. Paul is now graduating high school, and he grew up bilingual Cantonese English. Mom and dad spoke speak Cantonese at home, and Christy's mom and dad stayed with them, so it was all Cantonese. And he grew up quite comfortable in both Cantonese and English. When he was a little boy, mommy and daddy had to work a lot. So they occasionally hired a babysitter. The babysitter would come over, turn the television on to Mandarin cartoons. Now, you know this, but most people don't. Cantonese and Mandarin are not the same language. They are not both dialects of Chinese, okay? They are different languages. Uh, kind of like, I'd say, Spanish and Romanian, both romance. But if you know one, it is no guarantee you can immediately plunge in. It helps, no doubt, shared vocabulary, etc. Thanks to the fact that uh, Vincent understood Cantonese, has some vocabulary, and the wonderful subject matter of children's television. I'm a great fan of children's television, especially cartoons. I still watch SpongeBob. <laughs> oh gosh, I worry about the um, his job though. He's, he works in this restaurant, and the main dish is crab sandwiches, and the owner is a crab. I think there's something wrong with that. <laughs> anyway, SpongeBob is one of the nicest people, the nicest characters in the world. So the good uh, cartoons, his knowledge, and a little help from the caretaker. He started understanding the cartoons a little, gradually more and more. As he got older, he started watching children's television in Mandarin when he was in elementary school. In high school, his father brought home two movies every week in Mandarin. In the evening, the family got together and watched the news in Mandarin. Today, Vincent speaks Mandarin. When company comes over and they're Mandarin speakers, he's no problem. They have visited Mandarin areas of China and Taiwan, no problem at all. Here's the big point. Vincent doesn't care about Mandarin, one way or the other. He's not for it. He's not against it. He did not decide to learn Mandarin. What counted to him was the cartoons. <laughs> Acquiring the language was an accidental byproduct of all the TV that he watched, the movies that he watched. Vincent taught me something that I never quite understood, and I think a lot of us don't get it. Most people don't care about language. We are members of a lunatic fringe group. 
you tell a child in high school, you really should study your Spanish. It's going to be a big help someday. Not a single kid in the world cares. They want to go out skateboarding or go to the mall, whatever kids do that age, and socialize. But you tell them a good story. They're going to acquire, whether they like it or not, you will be in a now. Most language acquisition is a byproduct of doing something else. I hereby announce the end of the usefulness of the concept of motivation. Get them motivated to want to learn the language, doesn't matter. Give them compelling, comprehensible input, and it will happen. A similar case is Jack, not his real name, heritage language speaker of Mandarin. Family came to the United States when he was six, seven years old. He enrolled in a Mandarin enrichment program that Christy Lau uh, was running in the San Francisco area. A very nice program. I've been there several times. Lots of stories, games, free reading, etc. Jack didn't care. He didn't want to be there. So uh, Christy said, fine, you can drop out. But I want to give you a present as you're leaving. Um, she gave him a copy of the Stories of Afanti, a very popular uh, series in Chinese. He could kind of read them a little. He asked his mom to read the first. He loved them. He was so interested, he got his mother to read him the stories. And he washed the dishes. That was the agreement. That's how much he liked them. He kept improving in Mandarin as long as they could find stories about their feet. When they ran out, that was the end of his Mandarin development. He never was interested in Mandarin. He was interested in the stories. The same thing is true of English literacy. Rosalie Fink is a scholar in the New York area who's worked on this. Uh, this is written, published in a journal called the Journal of Adolescent and Adult Literacy. That's a horrible title. It used to be the Journal of Reading. I liked it a lot better. Um, she studied 12 people who had been classified as dyslexic. All were very successful as adults. Nine had published things. One was a Nobel laureate. As you see, 11 out of 12 learned to read between ages 10 to 12. One didn't learn to read until 12th grade. Get this quote. This is a big one. As children, each had a passionate, personal interest, a burning desire to know more about a discipline that required reading. All read voraciously, seeking and reading everything they could get their hands on about a single intriguing topic. None of them decided, I better learn to read. Let's sit down and do hooked on phonics. Instead, they got excited about something. That was their goal, to find out more about the topic. The explanation, the input was compelling. As I say in the notes here, language acquisition was never the goal. Well, I want to uh, rewrite history a little bit, or reanalyze uh, history of language teaching professions and bring you up to the moment. The job of language class is to give students compelling comprehensible input. That's what we're about. You would never know it looking at the history of language. Uh, when it all began in, in my lifetime, uh, the 60s audio lingual and grammar translation were the popular, they were the only methods. The amount of compelling input is zero. Absolutely as boring as could be. They were different, but they were boring in different ways. <laughs> the big breakthrough came with Asher TPR, much more interesting, much more exciting. But of course, there's a limit to what you could do with TPR the way Asher did it. I mean, how, how much can you do if, if uh, Susie's wearing a red blouse, touch your nose, you know? Uh, so it, it could have got a bit more exciting and we're working on it. After that came a method I'm sometimes given undeserved credit for, a natural approach, Tracy Terrell's method, much more interesting. Anything works in the classroom as long as it's interesting, comprehensible, TPR games, uh, all kinds of stuff. So it was quite good. Now we have TPRS, which goes beyond natural approach in terms of compellingness. TPRS makes input compelling in several ways. Let me talk about this. The next note is how to be compelling, which is my contribution for Thanks to my colleagues in TPRS, and this is Grant Boulanger and uh, Bryce Hedstrom, both of them assigned a book to me. When people ask me to read a book or suggest it, I never want to do it. But really, I like to read things that I want, you know, but this was good. Oh my gosh. A book called Social. The book says there, we have two systems. 
We have a social system, and we have a non-social system. Social system means thinking about people, thinking about your relationships to other people. Two astonishing facts researchers have discovered about the social system. It's the default mode, which means if you're thinking about nothing, you're thinking about other people. If you're just mulling things over, relaxing, your thoughts go to other people. Did I say, oh, Bryce, you're here. Did I say the right thing to Bryce the other day? Did I say the right thing to the lady who brought me my coffee this morning? I wanted it to be funny, but I'm not sure it really worked. Uh, <laughs> you know, you think about how our relations are with people. A friend of the family had the job of uh, running a website for uh, high school girls, and it was aimed at girls the first two years of high school. And I asked her what they wrote about. You know, they put on their blogs what they're thinking. They don't talk about boys. They don't talk about school. They talk about their friends. Susie didn't talk to me this morning. I wonder what I said. What's going on? We are obsessed with other people and our relationships with them. Another thing from the book, the reality of social pain. The body treats social pain the way it treats physical pain is the same system. You ask people, what was the most painful experience you had in the last two years? They won't say it's when I broke my arm. They'll say when I broke up with my girlfriend. Mm -hmm. it's, and guess what? Ibuprofen will relieve social pain the same as it relieves physical pain. That is astonishing. Okay, So this is very, very real. The other is non-social cognition, and I'm going to define non-social cognition in a slightly different way. For me, non-social uh, cognition is finding your life path, finding out what you're supposed to do. Mark Twain, the two most important days in your life, the day you're born and the day you discover why. I saw that in a movie on an airplane a year ago. The most violent movie I have ever seen. I loved it. The Equalizer. The only person in the world who could have played the part, Denzel Washington, unbelievable, so grounded, so together, it was amazing. It was about a retired CIA agent who's living in isolation, and he discovers a young lady in distress and takes care of it. Basically kills 30 people. <laughs> no sex, no nudity, just 30 bodies. Yes. Okay. <laughs> and at the end of the movie, he realizes that's what he's supposed to do. He's supposed to be a paladin. He puts it out in the paper. Got a problem? Call me. This is what I do. So to do that, we specialize. We have to find our path in a way that's different from others. We all have different paths. Very good explanation. There's an article by a man named Rosenblatt uh, called Don't Go to Your Left. High school basketball coaches say, you know, you can dribble with your right hand, shoot with your right hand, try it with your left. Learn to shoot with your left, then you'll be a real threat. Rosenblatt says, no. If you're always working on your weak spots, you never get good at anything. <laughs> Find out what you're good at and get better at it. The world needs you when you're to do to get your skill as high as you can. The path is long, but it's pleasant. Vonnegut says, it's not harrowing challenges, but rather tasks we find natural and interesting. Tasks we're apparently born to perform. When you know you're on the path, life is good. Uh, you're in a state of flow, etc. Wonderful uh, expression, title of a book called The Ultimate Seduction from Picasso. Work is the ultimate seduction. People who find their paths love their work. Well, how, does, uh, how are we gonna do this in classes? TPRS does this very well. Uh, I love Karen Rohn's chapter in the uh, uh, Lane Ray's book. Uh, fluency through. Fluency, help me. Through TPR storytelling. Fluency through, fluency through TPR. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. okay, and she has an entire chapter on, on personalization. Um, I'll start this by quoting a student's reaction to one of Bryce's class. You're going to love this class. We all know each other and like each other. 
That's you take this intense social stratification that you find in high school and you break it down. Uh, this is done in two ways. Co-created stories with students as characters and stories embedded in the here and now of students' life. Uh, taking one of Karen's example, don't just say we're going to a restaurant and the story we're going to Denny's on 20th and Pico. There is no Denny's on 20th and Pico. It's a Burger King, but that's all right. Uh, <laughs> Bryce has great uh, innovation of the special person interview. Each child, each person in the class is interviewed, made to feel good about the process, little output about who they are, their lives. Do you have any pets? Are your brothers and sisters? What do you feed your pets? What, how does your mom like the pets? Then the students are quizzed on that student's likes and dislikes and their family life. They have to pass the quiz, which means after a while, everybody knows everybody else and knows a lot about them. And the hypothesis, which again I get from Bryce, is that the path to understanding others is first done by understanding the student sitting next to you. Well, for going on, I'll try to make this, I'll be done by 7 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> the way we can go after non-social, one of the great ways, free voluntary reading, which gives you, our research says, gives you all the literacy you'll ever need and gives you all the knowledge that you need. Knowledge of the world, subject matter knowledge, knowledge of, even of science, and just reading fiction, you get to know so much of what's going on around you. We know that it makes more complex reading, so-called academic reading, more comprehensible, and it gives you the mental abilities that you need for success. Um, President Obama is quoted, the world is complicated and full of grays. It's possible to connect with someone else even though they're very different from you. You get this from books. It gives you an expanded theory of mind, uh, the ability to identify with others what they're thinking. And, I love this one, more tolerance for vagueness. This was just a comment on the election. Okay? <laughs> no simple solutions. We know that those that you look at people with school success, Ben Carson's one of them, became a reader at an early age. We know that people are readers, people who've had success, eminent people, have done an astonishing amount of reading in their youth. For me, I didn't have time to do this on the bottom, uh, one of my big reading habits in high school was science fiction. From science fiction, I got both the social and non-social factors. From reading early Robert Heinlein, I got the idea of hard work, the idea of working your way up, of doing your job correctly and taking it seriously, and my interest in science, which has kept with me to the present day. Well, I'm going to stop here because it's exactly 520. How did I do, guys? Great. Okay, thank you very much. Will you say where your handout is again? Pardon? Where is your handout? Will you say that again? Where well, my handout is on scratchandblogspot.com.